Yeah. You are now live. Let everybody come back in. Mm -hmm. Tell me when they're supposed. Okay, I will. Yep, uh, 17 people. Yeah, I already know who was, who was left and they didn't leave. But... Uh, there was 44 when we closed it. Okay. So, 21. Yeah, okay. I'll do both of them back to back. Hey everybody, welcome back. If you uh, have questions, just holler. Now that we're, we don't have as many time constraints with that first hour of me waxing on. <laughs> Get into the carving. Do you always use the longer style Sloyd knife? Uh, these days I do. When I first uh, started carving, I used the short one. Um, but it's not as versatile, um, especially with, um, you know, neat, neat gold grips or planing grips like this. The short one doesn't work. Even the chest lever is pretty limited with the short. But when you switch over, you end up poking yourself a lot. Okay, so I got the plan view down. I like that shape. There's a couple little things I see I'm gonna tweak. So, back to the original design, I'm going to carve right to the line. I'm going to get the spoon plan view uh, done 99%, 98%. Then I hollow. Jasmine and I are having these constant debates about how deep the bowl should be. And for those that know me, know that I'm quite stubborn. So I have reasons that I've been making shallower and shallower spoons, but she's won me over a little bit and I'm starting to make them a little bit deeper. <laughs> And that's no reason of what's best, it's just sort of where I want it to go. How effective is the shallowest spoon? And what I found <laughs> out was shallow spoons work really well. Look at the metal spoons that you're using, if any of you are unlucky enough to be using those. Um, they are quite effective. So effective that we don't even think about it when we use them. So. A deeper bowl spoon is nice too. And looks nice too. But at the yeah, at the end of the day, um, if it's too deep, it's going to be more awkward to clear. But if so, it's too shallow, then it lets your cereal drip out the side, maybe, which is annoying. Maybe. Depends on the bowl shot size. So. I'm not working with the finish just yet on that because now I'm going to work on the top of the side view. So I've hollowed and so it's a lot easier. This is where I need to put the glasses on.
So pivoting on, choking up on the, on the, um, this is a, the re, this is a reinforced draw grip, but it's, you, it's cut on the horizontal plane and it's pivoting instead of, um, being drawn. And so pinching that blade really helps. And then the other one is to choke up and use your thumb as a, as a pull, kind of a pivot area there. And then these ones, thumb pivot. Oops, green's funny that way. Cherry. Getting a little grain tear out here. The one downside to working with bandsaw materials is that we sometimes deviate from the grain orientation a little bit. And um, there's not much you can do about it because we're trying to make use of, of, uh, of all of our material. So right now I'm running into a little bit of a wily grain situation that normally wouldn't occur if I was using completely ribbon material. Also, This cherry has a little bit of figure in it, which is oh, yeah. which is nice to look at, but my profit margins are lowering. <laughs> so come more high work on this thing. But there's a nice couple little ripple, tiger ripples in there. So I have to make some decisions now on what I'm going to do here. Um, as I spend more time trying to solve the problems of this wavy grain, I'm going to try to come at it cross grain a little bit. Studio Vol joined. Oh, nice. Hey, Austin. I sent the steel out. <laughs> Choking way up on it, trying to trying to skew that cut cross grain on those fibers because there's some figure there that'll be pretty. But like I say, I don't want to screw around too much with this if, if it's taking a lot of time. So you know you can see the shear the curve of the rim of the bowl and then the handle shape it's not bad so the plan view is done and now my the point i'm trying to to finish now is to complete complete the top of the side view and then i don't have to think about either of those ever again we're not going backward, we're going forward. So complete plan view, hollow to make it easier to do the top of side view. That's completed, like 95%. Now I can go back and hollow. Phoenix Creation mm -hmm. said, our processes are very similar, except I'll leave the spoon bowl hollowing 
till after I've tied in the convex bottom surface. Can you give me a good reason to hollow first? Um, I've had lots of conversations about that with Barn in particular at like first spoon fest and my friend Fred live say too. Um, they do a lot of carving of the underside first. And I make the argument that you, you can do it, but you probably have a clear understanding of what your finished inside bowl looks like. And that's how you're able to do this. And so the only reason I do the inside first, it's probably the most critical when you're using it. And so why not do that first? Um, if you have a clear understanding of what that's going to be and still be really sweet, then go for it. But I have a hard time um, thinking that far ahead when I don't need to do that first, then this is quite easy. So that's my approach. But um, there's no, the, and, and as a teacher, um, people are going to make better spoons if they carve this first because they don't have the experience to know what the inside of the bowl looks should look like. This is for eating spoons in particular. Stirring spoons, serving spoons, it doesn't really matter. You can just, you know, but this one has to go in the mouth. So that's my argument on that. Um, we can do whatever we want, but if we're teaching, you're gonna see uh, better spoons in terms of utilitarian function uh, if you do the inside first. Well, there was a question whether you're making finishing cuts on the inside of the bowl now. No, I'm not. I have a special hook I'm going to use. I'll show you guys in a minute. So I like to leave just a little bit of a, a, a safety until the very end. And now the this is the finishing hook that I, I made. Um, it's forged from a 3 8 round stock. And it's very important that these larger hooks are forged from round stock or square stock and not flat stock. I even argue that even spoon knives should not be made from flat stock, but um, from thicker material. It could be flat, but it has to be a lot thicker. You're better off round stock, square stock, and forging the blade down takes more time and money, energy, but you're gonna get less flex. And that flex is, uh, it's a deflection of your energy, and also unconsciously, we feel the flex and we may react thinking that it might break. And so if you don't have any flex, it's going to be a more effective tool and more energy is going to go into the wood. Someone so, asked who makes? Uh, this one Reed made. This is one of the first wood spirit hooks that he and I collaborated on. I threw down that exact same thing. I wanted hooks forged from round stock, square stock. They can't flex. Um, but I, I've used Robin's hook. Robin's hook is great. Um, it's made from thin, high alloy steel, and it does flex a lot. It'll never break. But, um, you know, the flex, I uh, used his for years, but the flex, I think, uh, it, it tends to, I think it tends to interfere um, we're talking like hot rodding your tools, you know, after years of experience, this is stuff that matters. Most people aren't going to notice this stuff at all. And Dell Stubbs' hooks, um, he's making his on a flat stock, but they're thicker and they're forged a little bit, so it has less flex. So this one is designed for my style of spoon bowl. Very shallow. It's a very stout handle, short. I can take one 
it's kind of like a sh it's kind of like a tuker, but it's just a. set up for a specific bowl shape. I don't know, I made this like maybe 10 years ago, I don't know. Someone asked if you've ever used Nick Westerman hooks. Nicks are great hooks. Um, I don't feel the need to wait for two years for a knife when I have one, you know, I have, I have and I can make my own as well, but Nicks are great. They're well worth the wait. Uh, Nick's a great guy and a great smith. Um, so they're, they're sweet. I have used them, not for a lot of work, but to be honest, I'm a little bit disillusioned by um, the demand for tools right now. Jasmine's like, her eyes are getting really big. Um, you can get by with a, a, a really sharp uh, hook. It doesn't have to be like the top of the line or what's perceived to be the top of the line. If you do this long enough, you'll realize that something that holds an edge um, is gonna work pretty well. The trick is, is you have to know how to sharpen it. And so, to be honest about it, I think there's a real lack of skill in sharpening. And so a lot of these tools like nicks or reeds are coming, they're coming out of the box like superbly sharpened and this, those tools work awesome until you have to sharpen them. And then they slowly don't work as well. So my question is, is it the tool or is it just how sharp it is? And that's on us as the user. And so it's really, it's a little bit of a, of a you know, a stick poking the hornet's nest, but, but I, I think spend more time sharpening before you before you make any choices about what's best. I don't know if Sean's still listening, but Sean teaches sharpening at Spoon Fest and stuff. And I don't know if he'll agree or not, but I mean, there's a difference between its qualities of steel and edge geometry and stuff like that, but it's really splitting hairs. Someone wanted to know what steel you use to forge? This one is 01. Okay, so I did my finish hollowing. I'm gonna come back and... I'm thinking about uh, conversations that I had with Austin who might be listening still. And we're talking about Japanese kana and stuff and Hitachi steel and, you know, the, the, the steel really does matter in the end, but it kind of depends on how you're using it, what the tool is and how it's designed and what it's designed for and what your finished results are, are, are to be. You know, in our conversation, we were talking about you know, really high quality steel that's sharpened so that you can put a, basically like a mirror polish on something um, with very little pressure and the grain is wavy. You know, that's not a situation that we run into with spoon carving. Hi, birch bark, Beth. Hey, Beth. So, Now I'm tuning up the plan view, the last little bit. I've got the inside of the bowl completed. Are you done uh, with the inside or are you gonna go back nope, again? the inside's done. I'll still work on the handle plan view a little bit, but I'm gonna wait till it's thinner. And then work on carving it down. So I could go back to the mule. I could go to the ax block and use the ax to carve some of this thick stuff down, but the mule had really taken a fair bit of this off already. So I don't have to work too hard usually leaving a lot of thickness um, is a good idea. 
uh, so that you can work the top and the inside of the bowl down into the material and you don't run out, run out of room, run out of material. Um, and then go ahead and take the uh, underside down with an ax and then, and then your knife. I omitted that in my process here because I knew what was going to happen for the most part. This wavy grain that I'm working with this birch, I'm very cautious. I don't want something to happen here, catch the fibers the wrong way. You mean cherry? Huh? You mean cherry? What did I say? Birch? Yeah, cherry. <laughs> So thin front, work the handle down, the chest lever grip or the knee pull. So I got this area and the handle and now I just need to connect connect the two into a nice curve transition could be concave could be drawn out a little bit convex and concave But this handle's got that wavy grain, so I'm being really cautious. So that's looking good. Still a little thick. I'm going to go back one more time. But, back where? Uh, back meaning I'm going to carve the whole underside again. Uh -huh. But uh, I want to get it close first. Mm -hmm. So then the last little areas are, are uh, the back of the bowl. Joey just joined. Joey! Joey! <laughs> That's good. You, 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 uh, you joined in after I blamed you for my dull draw knife. grain here the thumb draw someone's asking about tangential versus radial Radial's the, radial's the better of the two for small spoons, I believe. Um, because there is no short, there's no short fibers at, at the front of the bowl. I had drawn it last time and I didn't know if it's still up. So... Tangential works if that's all you can get, uh, meaning you have smaller diameter wood. Hi, Daniel. Store Sloyd? Yep. Daniel. You should be watching because I heard that you don't carve spoons anymore. <laughs> Where'd you hear that? He posted it. He oh, said, yeah, I think he, he quit? He quit carving spoons. He's done. He just he's, likes to watch other people do it. Our wax handles. <laughs> All right, so I'm working this. <laughs> he said, I'm appalled. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, Mary. Working this, working this area down here. A lot of times, uh, it's, it's common to leave, I think, too much material in the back of the bowl. It doesn't need to be there. Uh, so 
you know, learning some good moves to uh, get that carved away is, is uh, well worth well worth the time developing those cuts. Oops, grain's going the wrong way. Oh. Transition spot. So you can see that kind of hollow. And the last is tuning up this, this plan to you. So when I look at this, I think uh, it's too, too wide here. Uh, for for what what I have going and I think this width is fine, but I'm gonna I'm gonna come down I'm gonna put a slight concave in in, in the, where the tip of my knife is and kind of come into a, a transition tight transition on both sides So we'll see what happens and if you look this is a great opportunity too. you can look at one side or you can look at the other mm -hmm. Both are sweet So which one do I copy? Do I copy the right hand or the left hand? You know, I get to decide. And so every step of the way we can learn, if we're paying attention, uh, we can learn new things about what might be sweet, what might we like. And it challenges us to try to copy them too. Someone asked about the recording. So I believe this recording is will be up in your stories for 24 hours only, right? Right. Okay. Um, we do have saved them. But... I... And we might just put them on YouTube. Oh. Uh -huh. We just are too lazy. All the videos we posted. Because they're should... like an hour or yeah. two hours. <laughs> well, back to back two hours. Yeah. Right. We should do it. We should put them on YouTube for everybody to rewatch. But uh -huh. You got 24 hours. Um... Tom Dengler said, show the broken bowl of the old large server to address the oh, grain yeah, issue, yeah. if good, you good could. Point, good point, Tom. What's... So, tangential, which is this bowl, um, there's short fibers here that you can just break, break off. And so that's a great example hmm. of why tangential isn't as good as a radial. Um, the crooked wood spoon, I'll draw, I'll draw it. The crooked wood spoon is probably the best, but um, it's the hardest to get. And, to, and you have to pick the right spoon for a good design. Don't design your spoon around the crook, because you may end up just carving a, a silly spoon that has short grain in the front. So... A tangential spoon. Is going to have rings. It's going to have short fibers right here. That's that's what we see in those rings. The radial spoon. You're going to see, depending on the diameter of the tree you start with, you're going to add the size of the spoon. You're going to see lines like that. And you can't draw what's happening from the side view, but you can draw from the end, which is if the spoon bowl is here, the rings are like this. Okay, so that's looking at the very front of the bowl. These might be more prone to splitting, especially if you have pure vertical grain. So, I believe that if you make the biggest spoon from the smallest piece of wood, that's going to be the best. And it's going to have diagonal diagonal grain and it's going to be really hard to split that in use because the, the fiber, the, the, the weak link between rings, the weak link in wood is between rings 
and you're going to have to pull that in, in, in a, a force like so for it to separate. Plus, this hypotenuse of grain connection is longer than this one, stronger. And a crooked wood spoon is, is really sweet. Um, that looks like like this. If you follow the grain perfectly, and my argument is there's no sense in carving a spoon out of crooked wood unless you're going to follow the rings. Because as soon as you cut like that, you've just turned it into a tangential spoon. It is a tangential spoon, technically, but you've just put short grain in the tip of the bowl, and you know the handle might be strong, but the tip of the bowl is going to be more fragile, and that's probably what's going to break, unless you're like leveraging ice cream or something. So you follow the fibers, find the right crook, Find the right crook for the bowl, the spoon you want to carve. Don't grab a crook and then carve a spoon to follow the fiber because it may not work very well. And so you're going to want to, that's the center of the log, split it. And your spoon, don't look at the rim, look at the underside. This is the bottom of the bowl. That's your rim, and there's your handle. That's how you want to do it, so that it looks like so. And you're going to carve that spoon opposite, so that you can, you get opposite meaning you're going to follow the fibers with the inside of the bowl, and then, and then go from there. But I did that last time. Anyway, I'll do another crooked wood spoon sometime. So the last little bit here, and I just thought of something I, I show people when I teach. I haven't taught in a while, um, but <laughs> because of certain rules, that's looking nice. But if you can, if you take a thin shaving, you can actually cut into the grain. You can cut the wrong way with good control, sharp knife. And so technically I'm not supposed to be able to carve this direction. Um, but especially when clearing the transition I'm going to carve uphill. You can't take deep shavings, but you can see I'm carving the wrong way, and it's as smooth as it was if I would have carved the other way. Sharp knife, tool control. Thin shaving, there we go. Nice thin shaving. I'm carving the wrong way. See that? Again, smooth as can be. So, what does that mean? Take your time. Go slow. Control your tools and sharpen your knives. How often do you like to strop? Someone asks. Um, that was the first time I stropped on this spoon. So maybe once or twice a spoon, depending on the wood. You stropped before you started. I started, yeah, before I started. and But I wouldn't do that every spoon. It just, I guess... When the, it's needed. <laughs> when it's needed is, is the real answer. <laughs> There's so many variables. The um, The wood sometimes has more silica. Cherry can be pretty silica rich up here in northern Wisconsin, but this one isn't isn't as particularly as bad as normal. I don't 
I actually think it's from northern Wisconsin. So I'm fooling around with the handle a little bit here. I want a little slight concave at the end. And so how I'm gonna do that is um, when you, when you're carving with a knife or an ax, you may not realize, but uh, the edge tools act like a wedge, especially, you know, not planes. These are freehand tools. And so when you are carving, and if this is like a wedge, the knife is always gonna leave, no matter what, unless you force it to stay engaged in the wood. Um, and that's because of the path of least resistance. Uh, the knife is like a wedge. There's energy traveling ahead of the split in the molecular level. And that kind of guides our path. Now, we unconsciously force the blade to turn into the wood if we want long shavings. But if we were to let the knife go on its own, it would just leave the wood. All right? It's a hard thing to rationalize because... We can't let the knife go because it's in our hand. But if we relax, the knife leaves the wood and it actually leaves the wood in a, in a beautiful trajectory. And so at the end of my spoons is when I tend to carve. I carve a little deep, relatively speaking, and then I let the shaving, I let the knife come out and it leaves a slight concave that you wouldn't be able to do if you tried in any other way. That's the tricky stuff. Same with this area. I'm going to cut in a little deep and then I'm going to let it go. And it'll make a nice little concave. Um, Mary said... You just flat grind your knives on stones when you refresh them, but if you had a Tormek, would you hollow grind? Uh, I probably would hollow grind, but um, for teaching tools probably, but I think that I prefer a flat grind or even a slightly convex grind, similar to that of an axe. I feel like there's more subtle things that you can do. It's more diverse, but it takes more skill. So it would be harder to control without a bevel. Ty Thornock is here. Hey, Ty. And um, Matt from Tokyo. Ohio Matt. Gozaimasu. Ohio Gozaimasu. I right. think it's the morning there. Oh, yeah, it's like 5 a.m. or something. <laughs> uh, someone asks, what thickness do you shoot for in the bowl? Are the front and back different? Uh, they are. Okay, so I can, I, I haven't carved in a while, so I'm not as uh, responsive to what I see needs to happen. The handle needs some tweaking. It's not quite right. Um, so I can fool around with that for, for quite a while, just, just because I'm a little bit out of practice. Um, so to answer the question, uh, front of the bowl is quite thin, back of the bowl is a little thicker. Um, it's that simple. So now I'm just going to go back around. I've kind of roughed it out. More than roughed it. And now I decide when I'll, if I want to put controlled facets on it. Just want to take some big, long, long cuts. You know, all of that stuff is more aesthetic than anything else. Um, depends on how I feel about it. Um, but the one thing to look at though is these fair curves. And I don't know if you can see, but the little rim that I left along the, the plan view, I've, I've taken too much here where my pinky is and it's thicker. You 
smooth and fair. I don't want the thickness to vary in subtle, like subtly but extreme ways. You know, so fair curve, lumps and bumps, all of that stuff really really affects the the end where the light and shadow hit the spoon so i want to really spend time on that section it doesn't matter what happens inside of that last little cut because you're not going to see it but you are going to see this point right along that corner that edge that's really important to take an extra step to fix. And I don't know if you can see it, but it's a lot better. Mm -hmm. And then the same with the top of the side view. Any of those little lumps and bumps, you know, we're going to be looking up at it like through the light. You can see it turns the spoon black and you can see lumps and bumps. You know, I can. Everybody's going to see that differently. Uh-huh. But there's definitely one here. There's a couple little ones there. And I would argue that if you can see it, you should do something about it. If you can't see it, then don't worry, because you can't see it. Someone wanted to see how you carve the transition from the handle to the bowl on the back. Okay, I'll it's do it. a tricky yeah, spot. Yeah, I'll do it one more time. Um, when it's thicker, I'll do it on this one. When it's thicker, it's, it's a, you're squeezing. It's a thumb bypass grip. The thumb bypass is this one. Or you can do thumb pivot. Okay, that's for one side. The other side, again, thumb bypass, choking up on the knife using the tip. And you can use the tip to cut radiuses. So squeeze and roll, turn your wrist. Or thumb pivot, but you have to be careful of the inside of your index finger with the tip of your knife on this one. But that's gonna do it too. Run out of power? Yeah, that's 10%. Okay. And we're at 42 minutes. Oh, man. Here. Oh. <laughs> Thanks. I didn't lose my knife on the floor. Whew. So, so that's the last here. I'll sit up The last little bit. You know, once you get into the fine, fine work, you're just taking thinner cuts. Um, I'll tell you all kind of the last thing that I do in my spoons when you're holding the spoon like this typical uh, modern spoon grip um, the the shape of our fingers here are, are convex and so we should have a concave triangular section mm -hmm. in the back that fit so what I do is I run my knife parallel to the fibers and hollow. It's the only way you're going to be able to hollow that into a slightly concave surface. Now that transition you can cut back into it like so. Or once you get control of your cuts, um, the resistance, I'm throwing out some advanced stuff here, the resistance that you feel on that shaving is where you can control your blades, geometry, how it affects the cut. So. Because of the grain in these two areas, I can't really cut in this direction into the handle. It's going to catch. But I can cut parallel. So I'm going to pivot right on that curl, that shaving, 
and switch to the other cut. Now this is super dangerous if you're going to add a lot of force and you can't control your knife. But if you're taking light shallow cuts and you can feel the resistance of that shaving, then you can pivot on it. Okay, the other side is a little trickier because we don't have our thumb to squeeze. We have to use our body as a leverage and get our knife parallel again. I hope you guys understand that those are fancy cuts there and they're risky if you try them uh, without the proper skills to match. Risky meaning you're gonna cut yourself. So same thing, I was able to put a concave and then the transition of this one. This one's a lot easier because you use, you're using your body. Another uh, kind of signature trick move. <laughs> You're letting all the cats out of the bag. That's okay. I'm tempting Daniel. <laughs> if he's still watching. Yeah. So now I've created a thinner area in here, kind of like the back of the bowl. You want to get rid of some of that material. Most spoons I see, people people leave too much. Back to sort of the cliche saying of remove everything that isn't a spoon. And that leads us to the back of the bowl and in this area in the handle tend to always be thicker because they're really challenging to get rid of that extra material. That's um, the next step, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna end it. The next step would be to chamfer. Um, you know, thinning this down a little bit, adding some decoration. Um, the thing that I would urge every one of you to do is to split out some straight grain wood, and practice making some chopsticks, and make those long cuts, smooth and long and that's going to improve your skills with the knife beyond anything else that you can do and it's something very easy to practice you don't have to worry about design you don't have to worry about curves you just get to practice feeling the shaving the resistance what happens when the edge is meeting the wood that's where all of the focus our intent our focus needs to be if we're going to control the knife in any uh, a highly skilled way. So, make chopsticks. Matt wants to know if you worry about the oils from your fingers staining the final spoon. Uh, I don't because I probably use linseed oil, but the oil won't stain it as much just from one or two, you know, one, one hour carving session. But if you have dirty hands and you're grubby and you take a long time to carve, your spoon's going to get dirty. Um, I don't worry about it, but other people might want to worry about it, is what <laughs> I'm saying. And if you're using indelible pencils, or really soft leaded pencils, you'll get this pencil lead all over your hands, and then that will be smeared all over too. So, it's, it's a legit concern for sure. So... What are we up for time? 49 minutes. So... All right, folks. Visit our website. Yeah, if you guys... Um, Donate if you feel so inspired. Buy some stuff if there's anything left. Join right. the newsletter if you're interested in future sales. Right, Jasmine hit the nail on the head with all those. Thanks for everybody who did buy anything, uh, buy stuff if you bought. Yeah, and um, Jeremy Biazzo wants to know who does your hair. <laughs> no one right now. Head grease, Jeremy, head <laughs> grease. <laughs> um... I'm trying to get Jasmine to cut my hair, but my I'm mom is a, my mom is a hairdresser and she's really good. And uh, I'm very I have very high standards. 
believe it or not, judging by my hair. Anyway, anybody, anybody have any other questions? Otherwise, we'll... we'll yeah, we'll wait a couple we'll minutes for some, some questions to, to filter through, and then we'll say goodbye. This would be a sweet spoon. I like it. More cranky than, uh, than, than normal. Jeremy says, I love it. <laughs> All right, everybody. Hope you have a, the rest of the day is a great one or the evening. Happy Mother's Day Happy to the Mother's mothers. Happy Mother's Day. No, dear Mother's Day in England and other countries? Or is it just an American thing? I don't know. Yeah, happy Mother's to all, Happy Mother's Day to all the mothers. And uh, speaking of that, I gotta call my mom. Yeah. Uh, what's happening next Sunday? I don't know what we're gonna do next Sunday. Send us a send us an email for, through the contact page on our website. Tell us what you want to see next week. Right. Good idea, Jasmine. Mm-hmm. Yeah, or private message through Instagram, but the contact page is probably better. Uh, the finish is. Walnut oil, linseed oil, something like that. Or, so or nothing. Asked. Or nothing. Yeah. Lately, I haven't been oiling them. Or Rushi. <laughs> All right, everybody. We'll see you. Thanks yep. for tuning in. Thanks a lot. Bye. Thanks.